Welcome to the Rotowire Fantasy Baseball Podcast. I'm your host, James Anderson. And today we're going to do a mailbag podcast. Haven't done one of those since the top 400 prospect rankings were fully updated uh, back in January 15th. So uh, well overdue for one of those. Um, this is uh, it's a fun time of year. It's a busy time of year. Uh, my favorite my favorite sports team, the Milwaukee Bucks, won 15 in a row. I'm in three slow drafts right now. Uh, just fired up, ready to go. Uh, first question uh, is from Max Wallner, and he wants to know, how does Gavin Lux's injury change your perspective on Miguel Vargas this season? Uh, I guess it lessens concerns over Vargas and Chris Taylor's job security if, if they were to play poorly for a stretch. Uh, but I think I think all the reporting was – it was pretty clear Vargas was kind of headed for a significant role, even pre-injury, but it does kind of give him a bit more safety in terms of holding onto a role. Uh, but the big, the big takeaway for me is Miguel Rojas is now a, a viable late round option in 15 team mixed leagues. Uh, he's a guy that I've, I've rostered even when he was on the Marlins. Cause he, he kind of does a little bit of everything. Uh, you know, he's, he's not great, but, as kind of your last middle infielder in a 15 team league. I think Miguel Bert or uh, yeah, Miguel Rojas is fine. Uh, Finney asks, can you talk about how you feel long-term about Bryce Miller and Junior Caminero? Their off season helium has gotten insane. Uh, well, Caminero has a chance to be a four category monster at third base. Uh, the outlook I wrote on him a few months ago, that's up on the site. I said that this is the type of hitting prospect worth paying up to speculate on. We're, we're maybe at the point now where enough people are trying to pay up to speculate on him that it might have flipped the other way, and, and maybe he's even overvalued in some circles right now. Uh, there's There seems to be sort of a rush from people to try to trade for him before he fully blows up. Uh, that's, a, that's a tight rope to walk, but... Um, I feel good about where I have Caminero right now. Uh, he's still at least two years away from the big leagues. So you got to factor that in. Uh, so then Daniel Harding asked about Bryce Miller as well. He wanted to know what the realistic ceiling is for Bryce Miller. Uh, realistic ceiling for me uh, with Miller is a high strikeout number two starter or SP two for fantasy. Uh, he could also be a top five closer. Don't think the Mariners are going to go that way with the development of Miller, but he's got the stuff to be a, an elite closer. Uh, I, I think he's a starter, though. Uh, he's mostly still a two-pitch guy. Uh, the, the fastball is one of the best fastballs in the minors, uh, plus slider. Uh, but I, I, he's not a finished product, and I, I have him probably too low where I've got him ranked right now, uh, outside the top 100. I think you could value him sort of back of the top 100 borderline top 100 if you want. Uh, but I think he's probably overvalued by some right now. So if you can, if you could trade Bryce Miller right now for uh, a guy I've got in the top 50, uh, I would definitely consider exploring that. And uh, Toolsy wants to know with Daniel Espino facing another lost year, does he stay the course or offload the risk? Uh, and, and then he asked if I'd rather have Tanner Bibby. Uh, so I was trying to make a point with where I ranked Espino back on January 15th. I had him as my ninth best pitching prospect. Uh, that was sort of meant to sort of tell you, like, this guy's extremely risky. Uh, and and people, I, I don't think enough people were factoring in that we did actually know it was the shoulder last year. That reporting came out. I think it was Mandy Bell of MLB.com. We knew that even before this latest shoulder injury. So we knew that he'd already missed almost a whole season uh, with a shoulder injury. Uh, now he's just in this horrible place. That, like, could, because he's too talented for Cleveland to just say, screw it. We're moving him to the bullpen. We're getting this arm to the big leagues once he's healthy. So that they're just not going to do that at all. Uh, and, it's going to take probably a couple of years at this point for him to build up into a true starters workload. And so you're in this, this sort of 
holding pattern. He might not even pitch this year. He might need surgery. He might not. He might miss some of next year if he has surgery. Uh, so it's just a. I mean, it feels like a sinking ship. It's a ten out of ten risk right now with Espino. If it wasn't there already, uh, in hindsight, I should have had him even lower. Uh, I was. I was trying to be like Espino was someone I wanted to sort of be the low man on. Um, I probably should have even pushed it further in the other direction, but. He could have also come to camp and just been like, I'm, I'm totally healthy. My shoulder's fine. I'm ready to shove. So uh, as for sort of offloading the risk, you probably should have done that before now if, if you were actually worried about offloading the risk. Uh, now he's it's kind of a – you might be able to still get some people to pay for the name value. And I think I've even seen people rank Espino as a, as a top five, top 10 pitching prospect, even post injury, uh, which I think is a, is a huge mistake. Just we're, we're going to have to wait multiple years, I think from the get to the big leagues as a starter and so much could go wrong between now and then. And so much has go, gone wrong already uh, as for, and, and I do not want to rank <laughs> Espino. He's, he's not even close to the majors. He's already in that group of prospects that I, that I'm going to hate ranking uh, because there's just so much, uncertainty involved and the skill is so off the charts it's really hard to find the middle ground there uh i would probably take bibby over him at this point it's even if the very the very very small chance you end up really regretting that i just think it's much much more likely that getting someone you know and and i'd probably shoot for a Brandon Fott, that's probably out the window. You could have done that probably before this latest news, and I had Fott ahead of Espino on that last ranking. Uh, Gavin Stone, Hayden Wesneski, a couple other guys that maybe don't have quite the name value uh, that you could at least ask around on, uh, guys that are, are close to big league ready or are big league ready in the case of Wesneski. Uh, so that'd be the type of player I would be trying to cash him out for at this point. Uh, and I would just – be hard. I'd just say hard pass if I were the guy that had those those three I mentioned. And then uh, Bibby is maybe a more realistic target. Uh, I I, I kind of go back and forth on that one, Espino versus Bibby and Dynasty. But I do think I'd probably just take the healthy arm at this point, which is going to make ranking Espino uh, really hard on that next update. Uh, Finney wants to know, uh, or, or he says, I'm having a hard time buying into these three industry darlings. Curtis Mead, and then he says the Rays and positional concerns. Jackson Merrill uh, says the Padres development hasn't produced, but seems to hype up guys. And then Evan Carter, he says power question mark. Uh, can you explain if I'm crazy or if there's some validity to these concerns? So with Mead, uh, the only concern for me is just hoping that the the elbow strain from last year doesn't pop back up. Uh, he played third base yesterday tuesday i believe uh so so far so good on that front uh that is the type of injury that maybe it pops back up maybe just an absolute worst case scenario he needs position player tommy john surgery but i think that's a small enough risk right now where i, I feel very comfortable with him as a top 15 prospect uh just if we're if we're evaluating mead the hitter one of the best pure hitters in the minors one of the safest hitters in the minors uh, has a much higher uh, ceiling and upside than I think a lot of people realize. Um, and nobody nobody on that raised depth chart standing in Meade's way uh, once they decide that that they're ready to start his clock. Uh, like Jonathan Aranda not standing in Curtis Meade's way. Um, you know, I think they're I, – I like Isak Paredes. I think there's room for, for both those guys, but uh, Meade's a better long-term – uh, bet than even Paredes. So, um, you know, Fidel Brujan's not standing in Curse Mead's way. So I, I, I'm not worried about the Rays thing. I think he's going to be so good that he's their number two or their number three hitter for a four or five year run. So I, I'm just not that worried about that with him. Uh, with Merrill, I, I agree about the Padres prospects getting overvalued, especially a few years ago. That was definitely a, a trend. Uh, and they've had, they've had some developmental hits. They've had some developmental misses. Uh, I mean, they did, I don't know if you want to say they developed Fernando Tatis, you know, who knows how much of that was them and how much of that was just him, but they did, they did the, the farm system did produce Fernando Tatis Jr. Uh, 
you know, they've had some kind of lower level developmental success stories. Like they, they can take the credit for developing Luis Urias, who's now kind of a low end everyday player with the Brewers. Um, you know, they, they drafted Trey Turner, uh, the nationals get the credit for the development there, but, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't think their track record is so bad that I'm going to ding Merrill for that. Uh, so yeah, I disagree about that one a little. Um, and then Evan Carter, I'm actually that one. I'm, I'm probably the most with you on him being a little overrated. Uh, he was actually someone that I, part of me did kind of want to want to rank him lower than 34th overall uh, where I put him on the last update. Uh, but I do think he's, he seems very safe as a leadoff hitter, uh, a guy whose bat will play in the majors. He will be I think, an everyday player in the majors. Uh, but I think it's possible that it's more kind of uh, Andrew Benatendi, uh, Brandon Nimmo type of fantasy production that is is definitely going to be useful. And that's that's not as bad as it sounds. Like I think when we give these sort of underwhelming comps on guys, people get uh, really bummed out because everyone's just chasing upside. But if you if you're rostering a prospect who's outside the top thirty and they turn into Andrew Benintendi or Brandon Nimmo, uh, that's that's an above average result um, for having that type of prospect. Uh, Danny J asks for my thoughts on Brandon Walter. He says his stats rule. Uh, yeah, I've been snagging Walter in some of the late late rounds of, of draft and holds. Uh, he's He's definitely my favorite of Boston's sort of next wave of, of pitching prospects. The guys that are sort of, you know, some of those guys got into the majors last year as swing men or spot starters, Walters, Walters better than all those guys. Uh, I think he's, he's someone I, I the more I've, I've uh, looked into him, um, he'll, he'll be someone I move up on the, the final uh, update, the, like the update right before opening day. Uh, he's, he's got, uh, three pitches. He's got excellent control, uh, definitely jumps out statistically. So Walter, Walter's legit. I think he could be a mid rotation starter. Uh, beer bot says, would you trade Brian Rocchio for Junior Caminero in uh, OBP league where timeline isn't an issue? Uh, timeline. I, I, people say this all the time in these questions, like, Timeline's not an issue. Uh, it has to be an issue. Unless, unless you're 100% sure your league's going to exist in six or seven years, you have to factor that in. You can't just be like, highest upside, rank them all for me, and like I'm going to take all these teenagers because they haven't shown any struggles yet. Uh, I think you have to factor in what Rokio's done at levels that Caminero's never even played at, and that that adds to the confidence that I have in, in Rokio, uh, the future big leaguer. He's just, he's hit benchmarks that Caminero hasn't hit yet. Uh, so I'm, I'm still sticking with Rokio, even in an OBP league, uh, that could end up looking bad, but I think on the whole, if you get to make this type of decision 10 times, if you take the Rokio guy all 10 times, you might regret it maybe three times. Um, so it's just, you know, take who, keep whoever you want. If if you're going to be bummed out by throwing Caminero back, then then keep Caminero. But um, I would still go rookie there. Uh, Brian Max says, "Will we see Mason win in 2023, and will he move to center field? Uh, we might see him in 2023. I have no idea why he'd be moving to center field. The his defense at shortstop, uh, his arm, like the, that's kind of why he might debut in 2023. It's not going to be because of his bat." It's not going to be because of a position change. Uh, he's, he's trending towards being their short step of the future. Uh, Stretch asks, with Joe Musgrove out for a while, is Michael Walker a good pickup in points leagues? Uh, sure, he's, but his rotation spot is safe regardless of Joe Musgrove. Uh, go look at that depth chart. Michael Walker is in that rotation as long as he's healthy. Uh, just don't expect more than 130 innings or so from Walker. Uh, Brian Mack, thoughts on Adrian Morion? finally stepping into a rotation. Uh, I mean, this could have been a question from four years ago, for all I know. Uh, Morion has been constantly trying to make it as a starter. He's never been able to make it as a starter. Doesn't have starter durability. I think that's pretty clear. He's shown that time and time again. I don't even think Morion's durable enough to have a James Paxton type of breakout year uh, that gets 
suckers to just keep chasing it for the next five years. Like I, I think he's just he's a sixty to seventy inning guy, tops at the big leagues. Uh, how they want to use him, that, you know, that's up to them. Doesn't look like he's going to close. I don't think he's going to start. Uh, Ryan, are there any skills or habits the best dynasty managers you know have? You're trying to improve that you're trying to improve on. Uh, so the best dynasty managers that I know are are better than me at trading. Uh, full stop. Uh, I'm just I'm a, I'm not a patient trader uh, because of how busy I am, how many leagues I'm in. Uh, fantasy baseball being my job, like it's just I only have so much time in the day to think about <laughs> fantasy baseball. So sometimes. I'll pull the trigger on a on a trade in a in dynasty without doing enough haggling and and that type of thing. Uh, and so the way I'm trying to improve on that is just by trading less. Uh, I'll still make a trade if I think it's an obvious win, but my strength as a dynasty player is the draft, the waiver wire, uh, evaluating players who are available. Those two avenues. Um, it's obviously easy to say, I want to go trade for this guy. Obviously a lot harder said than done, but um, that's, that's basically my plan is I'm just going to trade less. Uh, that's not going to make me uh, as good as the best dynasty managers I know, because, uh, and that's what I love about the Highlander is you don't have to make trades in the, in the Highlander to, to win the Highlander. Uh, but you do have to make trades to win uh, other dynasty leagues I play in. And uh, I just, that's, not my favorite part of it. Uh, Cody Martin wants my thoughts on Prelander Baroa. Uh, obviously, Baroa looked great in his spring debut the other day. Uh, his fastball slider combo is just ridiculous. I wrote about him in the uh, relief pitching prospect rankings article that went up uh, last week. He's completely disgusting. Um, I, I know there's some people that think he's a reliever all the way, and he probably is. I, I, that's what I said in that, that reliever article, more likely to relieve. I put Prelander to Burrow in that camp, but uh, I'm not closing the book just yet. I mean, he could be a five and dive guy. Uh, he's, I think the fastball slider combo is good enough for him to, to make it in, in that capacity. It'll, it might come down to the control. Uh, maybe the Mariners are just like, this guy could be, he could be a two inning weapon that we use twice a week and, that's how they extract value from him. Uh, I'm not sure how it's going to go, but I, I think Barroa's stuff is good enough that even if he's not a true starter, as long as he's pitching in the big, big bullpen, he, he might be able to provide, provide enough value in most formats. Okay, BMO, he's got a, a list of guys he wants thoughts on. Uh, Xavion Curry, uh, nowhere near as good as his minor league stats indicate. He's kind of more in the... Eli Morgan, Connor Pilkington group of guardians pitching prospects than like a Shane Bieber or Tristan McKenzie. He's five foot 10, no plus pitches, super crowded depth chart. Uh, just not interested in him in fantasy. And he doesn't have like some of these guys. It's like, well, if he go to, goes to the bullpen, think about the upside. Uh, that's not really the case with Curry either. Uh, I think he's kind of more of a middle reliever. Uh, Varland, uh, Louis Varland is the next guy BMO wants to know about. Uh, Varland, he's been a tough guy for me to kind of, uh, form an opinion on really uh he's he seems like a number five starter chance to outperform that because of how good the the strike throwing is and uh he's pretty deceptive but i think he's probably more just a number five um but i'm not as i'm not as confident in that uh, evaluation uh he wanted to know also about darius vines vines is my favorite of the guys that uh BMO asked about he's uh, he's got one of the best changeups in the minors. He is in a great organization, uh, probably more of a number four or number five, but I I'm rostering Darius vines in multiple dynasty leagues right now. I think there's, there's a chance he, he kind of becomes like a low end three or a solid number four starter. Uh, and that again, good team context. They've, they've had some success stories developing pitching. So I like Vines. Uh, he also asked about uh, Ryan Murphy. Um, kind of a lost season for Murphy uh, last year. Back and elbow injuries, uh, no plus pitches. Could maybe be a back end starter uh, because of the command, but he's got to build back up. Uh, you know, up over 100 innings this year, I think, to kind of make that a, a reality. 
Uh, Danny J asks, what do you expect from Lazaro Montes this year? Well, Lazaro Montes is going to hit the ball really hard. He's going to hit some tape measure home runs, uh, presumably in the Arizona Complex League. I don't think he's ready for uh, low A. Uh, I have no idea how the hit tool is going to translate. It's just it's so hard to uh, evaluate Dominican Summer League guys. Um, you know, he struck out more than he should have last year, but he also walked a ton. He had an OPS north of 1,000. Uh, I kind of see him to kind of give you some sort of like – archetypes he's sort of he's got the J- john kenzie noel of the guardians kind of just hits the crap out of the ball really big um strikeout concerns you know there's also there's high end outcomes there like you know he's jordan alvarez like body wise power wise that's that's kind of what we're talking about highly unlikely he's that good of a hitter but um it's just, I'm excited. I'm really excited. Maybe he just strikes out too much. Like if, if Montes is striking out 30% of the time in the ACL, he'll be a faller. Uh, but if he kind of gets the strikeouts in check, he could put up some pretty crazy numbers there. Uh, bounce back athletics asks for Brandon Fott's ETA. Uh, he says, I can understand Ryan Nelson, but Zach Davies. Uh, well, I think fat is up within the first month or so. And I wouldn't rule out him winning a job this spring. Um, uh, Fott is a finished product, in my opinion. I don't think he needs any. Uh, I don't think he needs a second more in the minor leagues. Uh, was the best pitcher in the PCL last year. Put up good numbers in the PCL last year. Uh, Zach Davies is basically there uh, to absorb innings in the event that you know they've got Nelson, uh, who's had some durability concerns. They've got Dre Jamison. They've got Brandon Fott. They don't want to go into the year needing those guys to pitch a full season in the big league rotation. So I think that's why Davies is there. I don't see them being like, oh, we can't give Fott Zach Davies a spot. Like whenever they're ready for Fott, it's <laughs> it's gonna be easy to move Davies to, to long relief. Uh, David M. DiCenzo says, Do you see guys like Noah DeNoyer of the Orioles, Richard Fitz of the Yankees, Tristan Beck of the Giants, and Abner Uribe of the Brewers potentially making the rotation someday? Uh, David, I'd, I'd recommend checking out that reliever article I released last week, uh, references a lot of pitchers in terms of just, do I think they're going to be a starter? Do I think they're going to be a reliever, et cetera. Uh, of those guys, I think Noah DeNoyer could start. He has the stuff to start. I think he was sort of a, a revelation, um, when the Orioles protected him from the rule five draft, uh, and kind of after after looking into things, like I, I think he could start. It's it's kind of about handling the starters workload with him, and the fact he's already on the forty man. Do the Orioles opt to just kind of move him to relief and and kind of get those innings now? Uh, that'll be interesting to see. Uh, but of the guys you you mentioned, I think Denoyer's <clears throat> got the best chance to start. Uh, Fitz and Beck, TBD. They they've got two good pitches. They need a third to come along. Uh, yeah, you know, they 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 could be relievers uh, at the end of the day, and then Uribe is a reliever all the way. <clears throat> all right, Artur Dominguez, thoughts on Andy Rodriguez for 2023 and beyond? Where do you envision the Pirates playing him, and when will he debut? Uh, Rodriguez is my top ranked catching prospect. I think he's going to hit for average. I think he's going to have IOBP, uh, especially relative to other catchers. Uh, like I could see him hitting like at, at peak, I think his batting average could be around 265, maybe 350 OBP, that type of thing, which is elite for a catcher, obviously. Uh, I think it probably comes with around 20 homers and he's athletic enough to, to chip in five, six steals, something like that. Um, so, I mean, the main appeal with Rodriguez is he's not going to hurt you anywhere in fantasy. He's not going to be a drag on your batting average. He's going to hit for enough power to make a difference there. And he has a chance to be one of those guys who just plays a ton and is in the lineup even when he doesn't catch it. Uh, he, he played a little second base last year. Uh, he could DH. So, uh, I, I mean, he's, he's going to be a catcher primarily. Uh, they might even scrap the playing second base thing. Uh, but I, I think we can dream on him being uh, among the league leaders in, in plate appearances by a catcher. And for when will he debut? Uh, May or June? You know, that that's a that's a rough guess, uh, kind of along the lines of O'Neill Cruz last year. 
This is obviously a very cheap organization. They're going to save money any way they can. So that probably means keeping him down uh, for a month or two. Okay, J Ship D. What's the type of return you'd cash out Ellie De La Cruz for in a dynasty league before he debuts? Is a player like George Kirby enough? Uh, so I have Kirby at 63 and Ellie at 83 on uh, the dynasty ranking. So yeah, that, that'd be a, a great target if you're looking to cash out Ellie. Uh, Zach Gallen, Christian Javier, uh, a couple other starters to consider trying to get for, for Ellie De La Cruz. Uh, I'd also consider if you're in win now mode, if you could turn Ellie De La Cruz into Emmanuel Classe or Edwin Diaz, I would I would consider doing that as well. Okay. The fantasy baseball season is underway, and there's no better place to play than underdog fantasy, the easiest place to play fantasy baseball. Right now, underdog has MLB best ball tournaments live, including the Dinger, which has 500K in total prizes. In best ball, all you do is join a contest, draft your team, and that's it. There are no waivers, no trades, and no in-season management. Draft 20 rounds of players and get the best cumulative scores in your starting lineup. Three pitchers, three infielders, three outfielders, and one flex each week of the regular season. Getting started is simple. Go to underdogfantasy.com, sign up with the promo code RWMLB, and not only will Underdog double your initial deposit up to 100 bucks, but you'll also get six months of Roadwire subscription for free. Again, that's Underdog Fantasy, promo code RWMLB. Draft your 100K Dinger team today. Fantrax is the most customizable fantasy platform in the industry, offering the greatest fantasy experience for your dynasty keeper, redraft, and best ball leagues. So right now I'm, I'm in the, uh, the Tout Wars draft and hold uh, 50 round OBP draft with a bunch of other great players. Um, Vlad Sedler keeps sniping me in there and uh, Fred Zinke's putting together a really good team. We're doing this all on Fantrax right now. Uh, just by far the best player pool. Uh, I mean, that that's really kind of what you can use to separate yourself as a host site for dynasty leagues is just, give us all the players we want to roster, right? Um, I used to host a, or I used to commission a league on a site that just had none of the the pop-up prospects were in the system. So I was always going in there and have to create uh, fake player cards so that people could roster these guys. You just don't have to do any of that with fan tracks. Uh, just very customizable. If you want to move your league there, if you're on one of these sort of outdated sites, very easy to do. Uh, just can't, can't rec- recommend it highly enough. So, uh, move your league to fan tracks. Uh, try try fan tracks right now. They've got public leagues you can play. Uh, sign up for free today and be entered to win an official MLB signed jersey by Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Simply go to fantrax.com slash rotowire and draft and sign up today. That's f a n t r a x dot com slash rotowire. Fantrax, the home of fantasy sports. All right, M Fest says, what guys in the lower levels could rock it to MLB? I think he uh, kind of specified that he's in a league where. If he drafts a Fernando Tatis type of guy or, or maybe a Michael Harris type of guy who just gets the big leagues way faster than people expect, that's a huge windfall for him. So uh, these guys, you know, I'm not saying they will move super fast, but uh, Jackson Holiday and Tamar Johnson from this past draft class, they are two of the more advanced prep hitters to come out of the draft in, in, a, in a while. Uh, and I could see... Uh, especially like if the Orioles are awesome this year or maybe even just awesome next year. Uh, I think one of these years they're going to just win way more games than people expect. And if holiday is tearing it up, uh, maybe they start his clock way sooner than we think. Uh, maybe, maybe Johnson is just one of those guys who it, he just hits everywhere he goes in the minors and they, they can't hold him down. Uh, Jackson Merrill though is a big one. Uh, the Padres are one of the more aggressive teams when it comes to pushing guys up the ladder. And he, and I think Fest even referenced Fernando Tatis. I mean, that was part of it. Not, not many teams I think would have pushed Tatis as quickly as the Padres did. Uh, Jackson Merrill could be the next one of those guys. He went to the Arizona fall league. He was one of the youngest guys there. It was very impressive. So I think he's a guy to keep an eye on. And then uh, I'll throw another one out. Uh, Emmanuel, Emmanuel Rodriguez with the twins. Uh, missed uh, the the second half of the season with an injury, but you know what if he shows up this year and it's just like this guy's got to be in Double A, and then he has success at Double A. Uh, I could see Rodriguez really sort of fast tracking himself this year. Um, Casey Unrath, 
are there any generational talents or someone who could be a top 10 fantasy pick for multiple years? You're ranking lower because they are still a year or two away from the majors. Uh, well, Casey, uh, and this is kind of a, a tutorial for anyone who hasn't used the filters on the, the top 400, uh, but you know, go to rotowire.com slash try if you want to check out the uh, Rotowire Top 400 prospect rankings. But you can go in there, you can click the green button that says add filter, and then make it uh, select ETA after you select add filter, and then make it 2024 or greater. And that's basically the guys we're talking about here. Uh, so Drew Jones, James Wood, Jackson Holiday, Tamar Johnson, Elijah Green, Jackson Merrill, Jason Dominguez. Uh, those are guys who I've ranked as high as I feel comfortable <laughs> ranking them, um, even though they're they're a ways away from the majors. So uh, lots of cool ways to use the filters on the top 400 rankings. Uh, and then Toolsy, he wants to know, who are some of your favorite buy now guys before they take off? So I'm kind of interpreting this as sort of undervalued guys. Uh Royce Lewis to me is a buy right now. Uh, he is, he's just, he's getting slept on so hard in some circles. Uh, he could be getting drafted around like pick 50 or 60 in redraft leagues next year. He's going to come back around the all-star break. Maybe, maybe the knee is just, <laughs> it's a lemon and he just, he can never play on it. He's always injuring it. That's, that's in play, but I think I'm, pricing that in by having him as a back of the top 10 guy, because if he's just the guy we saw in the majors last year, Royce Lewis is a monster in fantasy. He's contributing in all five categories. He's going to be hitting in a, in a nice spot. He's going to be playing every day, uh, extremely athletic, extremely toolsy, very hard worker. Uh, and so I think what you would have to pay to get Royce Lewis right now in dynasty, especially if the team that has him is a contender and doesn't like the fact he's going to miss the first half of the season. Maybe the team that has him is a rebuilder and just wants to get a, a younger group of prospects for him. Uh, I'd, I'd go after him because I think you can buy him for just far less than he'll go for if he can stay healthy all season. Uh, Curtis Mead is another guy uh, just – a total boss. He's a, he's a, he's a monster, uh, hitter, uh, could be, you know, I think plus hit tool is just sort of a fair projection for him. He could have a 70 grade hit tool. Uh, I think he's going to hit for more power than people realize. Uh, and I think you could get him right now in a lot of dice leagues for roughly like 10 guys that I have ranked below him. Uh, maybe the guy that has Mead is just a, a true believer like me, but, uh, I think he's a guy you could get uh, cheaper than you should be able to. And then uh, Everson Pereira, Emmanuel Rodriguez, Junior Caminero, Josue Dupala, and Miguel Blaise are some guys that I could sort of, well, Pereira, I'm sort of driving the bandwagon on. And I just think he, you could get him for, you know, just a kind of a criminal, criminally low price if whoever has him does not, uh, follow my advice. <laughs> um, but I think the other guys, you know, Rodriguez, Caminero, DePaula, Blaise, they have a chance to just rocket uh, up the rankings with, with a good year this year. Uh, Ulysses says, or he asks, are you at all concerned about Jordan Walker's 6'6", 250 pound body type holding up until age 29, 30? I, I wouldn't say I'm, I'd be surprised if he dealt with some uh, durability stuff. I mean, we've seen, you know, it wasn't that long ago that Jordan Alvarez had both his knees had problems and, you know, Aaron judge has missed plenty of time and John Carl Stanton is always going to miss 40 games. So, I mean, those are the guys that are kind of as big as Jordan Walker is going to be. So it, it could happen. But he's just a he's a way better athlete than those guys, so it's not it's not something I'm factoring into his ranking. It, it's not uh, it's not like that. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me though. Um, and then um, more Walker, Dandy F. Chiggin says, is Jordan Walker ceiling something like J. Rod? Uh, he seems faster than previously believed, and maybe the power could be eighty grade. What does his ceiling look like? Uh, I. <laughs> I, I appreciate the question. Uh, this is this is one of my least favorite comps that's out there. I I just I really wish that it had never been made. It, but I also understand how 
it kind of got to this point. He he's tall like Rodriguez. Uh, he played in the Arizona Fall League. He can steal more bases than people expect. But Rodriguez is one of the best prospects I've ever ranked, uh, or will ever rank. Uh, I could be doing this for another twenty years, and Julio Rodriguez might be one of the ten best prospects I've ever ranked. Uh, Walker is my fourth ranked prospect right now, and I don't think you could justify having him higher than three. So to compare a guy like that to one of the best prospects I've ever ranked, I just don't like it. Like I, I understand how it's sort of 80% there, but I, I don't like comparing guys to, to the, to the greats and Rodriguez is, is just a, a phenomenal uh, talent right now. I think one way to kind of look at it is, is Rodriguez he moves like he's six foot two or six foot one in, in a six foot five person's body. Uh, and Jordan Walker moves like he's a fast athletic six foot six. It's just, it's kind of a different, it's just a different type of athlete to me, uh, to my eye. Um, and Rodriguez was just like, his track record is just, uh, it's, it's just more impressive to me than uh, Walker's track record. So uh, Walker could end up hitting more home runs. Like I could see, you know, maybe Walker has a, has a 40 home run season at some point. Um, maybe Walker is stealing 15 to 20 bases, like as a rookie or as a sophomore, I don't really see Walker being a guy who's stealing more than 10 to 12 bases in his mid to late twenties. Whereas I think Rodriguez is just going to kind of keep doing it. Ulysses, long-term Uri Perez or Gavin Williams, uh, Perez, but it's just going to be whichever guy stays healthier. So we obviously don't know the answer to that question, but I'd go with Perez. Uh, Paul, you have 10 starting pitchers in a row from 117 to 126. Cade Cavalli, Ryan Nelson, Cooper Jerpy, Brandon Barriera, Harleen Susana, Cade Horton, Dylan Lesko, Bubba Chandler, uh, Connor Prelip and Emmett Sheehan. Which ones are your favorites to target in Dynasty Leagues? Well, I've already targeted Jerpy in a uh, first-year player draft on a Dynasty League team where I was light on pitching. And maybe uh, – I don't, I don't know if I had, had Jerpy as my best available uh, prospect when I took him, but I just had so many good hitting prospects that – I, I just felt that I needed a pitcher there. And I, I think Jerpy's the, the best guy to go after in first year player drafts on the pitching side. So he's a target. Uh, the, the rest I think are properly valued for the most part. I'm, I, I could see myself moving Ryan Nelson uh, above this tier uh, on the late March update. If he has a good spring, um, the, the Barriera, Susana, Lesko, Chandler, all extremely risky, all have super high ceilings. So, and they're all, they're all a little different. So it's just kind of ranking all those guys together. was sort of a way of like, you know, what's your flavor? What, what do you, what do you go for? Do you want the guy who's, who's close to the majors and has some durability concerns and Cavalli, uh, Barriera's one of the best young lefties in the game. I think he could have a, a monster jump up rankings this year, but I could say the same, you know, Susana could have a, a big jump. If, if he shows a solid third pitch and better command, I mean, he could, he could skyrocket. Lesko, once he gets back from Tommy John surgery, could quickly establish himself as one of the best pitching prospects in the game. Bubba Chandler, if he can just throw more strikes, I love his upside as a starting pitcher. Uh, I think Prelip is actually a little undervalued right now. Um, Emmett Sheehan, I, I wrote about in the, the reliever prospect rankings. I, I love Sheehan's fastball. It's just that fastball is going to play and it, it might be in relief, might be in the rotation, uh, but I kind of just want to ride Sheehan's fastball <laughs> as far as I can. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, go, go check out, uh, go check out the relief article. I mean, I, I wrote the outlooks on, on all those guys, um, but it's just kind of what, what type of pitching prospect are you, are you interested in? Uh, sewer league, which pitcher is most likely to contribute positive MLB stats in 2023 out of Tanner Bibby, Emerson Hancock, Michael Grove, and Taj Bradley, uh, Taj Bradley. He's on the 40 man. He, uh, you know, Tyler Glassdale has got the oblique strain. I don't think it's going to go to Bradley, 
But Bradley, it's it's kind of easy to look at that depth chart and see a path to Bradley making double digit starts in the majors this year. Uh, Hancock is. I, I have no idea how his name value is still doing as much lifting as it's doing right now, but Hancock's a, a back end starter, middle reliever, like just not interesting to me in fantasy at all. Uh, Grove, I, I just don't think he's very good, and the Dodgers have endless options that are that are better than him, uh, despite him being on the forty man. Uh, Bibby would probably be my next pick behind Bradley. Uh, he's well, he's the next best of these pitchers behind Bradley. I mean, that's pretty much what it boils down to. Um, but even with the Cody Morris injury, I I would still take uh, Tosh Bradley over over Bibby for 2023 value. Tim Bukanowski, I'm picking at the end of the first round in my first year player draft. Is it better to trade for a pick in next year's first year player draft or hope someone like Spencer Jones falls? So I know most of you know this, but I don't follow amateurs year round uh, at all. Uh, I studied them in the couple months before the draft and like a month leading up to January 15th. I just do not have the bandwidth to be following amateurs to, to the extent that I would feel comfortable saying that I'm like an expert on, on amateur prospects. I'm just not an expert on amateur prospects right now, especially. So generally what I'll tell you is I think the next year or like the next class of draftees always gets overvalued from say like September to April. It's just go look at who people thought were going to be the best guys in September or October and go look at who people think are the best guys after the draft. It's always just so different. So uh, trying to sort of follow these guys and, and get ahead, I just think it's a, it's a waste of time. Uh, I, if, if you could guarantee me you're getting like a top three pick next year and you've got a late first round of this year, sure. I'd, I'd make that trade. Uh, but I don't, you probably don't know that for sure. And I wouldn't sleep on like, there's really good prospects to take a shot on late first round. You could get uh, Cooper Jerpy. Uh, you could get Jet Williams. <clears throat> you could get uh, Dylan Beavers. I mean, go, go read my first year player draft blueprint article from, from a month ago. Uh, that's, that's kind of where I would start. And, uh, you know, if you want, if you want some detailed analysis on next year's draft class, uh, baseball America prospects live, lot, lots of great places to cover that. Uh, Banks Thompson needs to drop two of Brendan Davis, Hayden Wesneski, Aaron Ashby, Kyle Manzardo, Marcus Stroman, and Tyler Molly in a dynasty points format with a win now team that also has good future pieces. Uh, I would drop Davis because of the extreme risk. And I would drop uh, Marcus Stroman uh, just kind of doesn't really fit with the rest of these guys from, from an upside standpoint. I mean, we know what Marcus Stroman is. Like if, if you want that on your team and your win now season, go for it. But that, that'd be my drop. Uh, Jason Herb, who would you take in a head to head dynasty? Kumar Rocker, Sixto Sanchez, Nate Pearson, uh, Pearson by a mile. I think they're all relievers and Pearson's just Pearson's in the majors. He's already humming at triple digits this spring. He, I think he'd be next up for saves. Maybe if, if Jordan Romano got hurt uh, right away this season, maybe they'd go with uh, like Eric Swanson or someone more uh, experienced, but uh, Nate Pearson could be a closer and it might only take, like an injury to one guy for that to happen sometime this year. I don't see Sixto Sanchez doing anything to help you in the big leagues this year. It's just going to be about trying to build his innings up and stuff. Kumar Rocker touched on, uh, I think in the, the reliever article, he's just as risky as it gets right now. You could maybe dream on him being a closer too, but really if you're taking Kumar Rocker, like just take Nate Pearson. That's what you're hoping Kumar Rocker turns into. Uh, Ross Red K looks like you're pretty out in James Triantos with him dropping off the list. It's just a solid hit tool, no pop. Uh, I'm not out on Triantos necessarily, uh, but I'm out on him until he can kind of show that he can hit for more power in games, uh, and not not just a little bit more. Like he's a bad defender. He needs to be a 20 plus homer guy at least uh, to have a chance. So. You know, if you're going to be at the bottom of the defensive spectrum and you don't have plus power, you're probably not going to play. Uh, Ross also wanted to know, why are you lower on Jace Young? Similar profile. Uh, actually, 
yeah. eerily similar profile to uh, James Triantos, where it's just he's a terrible defender. He's going to a team with zero track record of developing. He didn't hit for power in his debut. Uh, just a lot needs to go right for for Jace Young to like he'll he'll probably get to the big leagues, but I just don't think Jace Young is ever going to be a guy that you're excited about having in dynasty. Uh, Matt Angelo, can you explain why you're a bit lower on Gabriel Gonzalez of the Mariners than others in the industry? Uh, I'm, I'm kind of trying to, so I, I lumped a bunch of my favorite unproven teenagers from uh, Brady house at 86 to Anthony Gutierrez at, at 116. You'll see probably like a dozen uh, teenage hitters in that range. And I've got Gonzalez right in that mix. Uh, I think he could climb. He could climb into the top 40, top 30 with a great season, but he doesn't have a great body. And I'm trying to not push teenagers higher than that range, unless I just really believe in them, uh, which is kind of the case with like Junior Caminero and Jet Williams. I've, those are guys I'm sort of like, yes take this guy let's ride this let's ride this all the way to the top gonzalez you know we had a, a question earlier uh, commenting on how padres prospects always seem to get overvalued that's happening with mariners prospects right now uh gonzalez would not be ranked as high as he's ranked if he were in a different org on a lot of lists uh same thing with bryce miller uh i just think we we for whatever reason people kind of just fall in love of like the organization uh, of the day, uh, the organization du jour. And it's, it's the Mariners right now. They can do no wrong. Everyone's just trying to get the next great Mariners prospect. Uh, I, I just think he's, he's a good prospect. Um, but I, I think I've got him ranked appropriately for what he's proven so far. Uh, Nick. And I wonder if this is Nick Lofton who asked me the question, but Nick wants to know with Nick Lofton's versatility around the diamond, do you think he can break camp as Royal starting third baseman? Uh, that seems like a stretch to me for a guy who hasn't been better than league average since he was at high A as a 22-year-old. 22, 22 uh, and Lofton is a guy who I used to think was sort of a sneaky fantasy prospect just because he was kind of one of those you know hit tool, how much power does he have, moves around, uh, sneaky athlete type of guys. And just the the inability to, to do much at double A AA or triple A, uh, <clears throat> I think he, he might get a look as a bench piece this season. And if he performs well, he, he could play regularly somewhere next year. I mean, I'm I'm probably higher on Nick Lofton today than I was on Michael Massey a year a year ago, or like Nate Eaton or someone like that. So you never know with teams that are this bad who's going to get to play. But uh, even if Lofton were playing, you're just <clears throat> it's just going to be empty stats or bad stats, bad team. Like you might hit like 245 something like that. Uh, downtown. Who are some under the radar in quotes rookies that could surprise with real 2023 value? <clears throat> and uh, downtown tagged uh, DVR and Ian Khan and Nando Defino in this question. Um, so he wants kind of a Nando style under the radar prospect, I guess. Um, <clears throat> so there really isn't such a thing as a under the radar prospect that I believe in who you guys haven't been made aware of. Uh, Brandon Walter kind of comes to mind uh, who had touched on earlier in the show. Uh, Jordan Diaz. I've tried to make my uh, love of Jordan Diaz known. Addison Barger, Michael Garcia, uh, not technically prospect eligible anymore, but Michael Bauman with the Orioles, Joseph Ortiz with the Orioles, Robert Gosser, Matt Walner. Walner is maybe the best of these for just sort of the, the spirit of this question because he's he's he actually is under the radar. I think the rest of those guys, to some extent, there, there's people that are quite high on them. Walner probably won't hit enough, uh, but I think he, to me, he kind of reminds me of uh, Joey Gallo 2.0. Um, and I mean that as a, as a compliment. Like, I think he could be a 225 hitter with a great OBP who just does a ton of damage. And nobody really cares about Walner right now because they've still got Trevor Larnock, who I prefer over Walner, and they've still got Alex Kirilov, and they've got Joey Gallo himself. So there isn't really anywhere for Walner to play, but 
the power is just insane in OBP leagues. Uh, I think he, I think he's very intriguing. Um, less so in batting average leagues, but uh, yeah, Jordan Diaz, Addison Barger, Michael Garcia, uh, Joseph Ortiz, some other good names on the position player side there. Kevin Thurber, are you high on Logan O'Hoppy and self Frelick long term? I am, and I I texted Jesse about this a uh, week or two ago, but I really loved uh, Jesse. I think he made a a, a comp on the uh, there is no off season podcast, the baseball prospectus one, I believe, where he uh, compared O'Hoppy to Will Smith uh, as as like a ceiling comp, and I really that one like really kind of. Uh, hit home for me because I, I 100% get where Jesse's going with that comp. Uh, just two guys with excellent control of the strike zone get to as much power as they they possibly can. Um, and we just we have to see how it translates for Ohapi. Uh, I'm fine with him as my catcher two in in redraft leagues. If I miss out, like I'm I'm usually. I don't really want to go much lower than Danny Jansen or, or Kyber Ruiz as my catcher two, but if I have to, Ohapi is, is someone that I still feel feel fine with as my catcher too. Uh, if I have to go lower than that, I'm, I'm not that into it. Um, and then Sal Frelick, I, I kind of think he's going to just be – he's going to be something close to what Stephen Kwan is. Uh, maybe a touch more power, maybe more speed. Uh, I think it's I think it's really similar to Stephen Kwan though with Sal Frelick. And I think he's going to be up for – about four months this year. Kevin Thurber, who's next year is Andrew Painter and Jackson Churio. So with the understanding, these are completely unrealistic expectations. Uh, I'll answer the question and say, it's not going to happen, but Josue DePaula of the Dodgers could be next year's Churio. Tink Hentz, I guess, next year's Painter. I mean, I basically just <laughs> went for like the, the highest ranked, teenage pitcher I have uh, who's in the lower levels and that's Tink Hens. But um, I mean, you're just, there's not going to be a, a next year's Jackson Trudy or Andrew Painter. Uh, Stinky McLinkerson. Who do you think gets to the majors first between Tanner Bibby and Gavin Williams? Uh, I would, I would short both of them for 2023 innings and 2023 starts specifically. I would not feel if I take one of these guys in a draft and hold, I'm not like, Oh yes, I got him. I'm just kind of like, Oh, hope that works out. Uh, I, I guess I'll, I'll say Williams. Cause I just think he's a better pitcher, but um, that's a tough call. Kid for the win. What could Everson Pereira look like as a regular in the bigs? So I've mentioned this comp before. I like it. Uh, Tyler O'Neill. I think, like that's the reason I have Everson Pereira ranked where I have him ranked is because I think the fantasy production could be very similar to uh, 2021 Tyler O'Neill at peak, uh, which is a, which is a beast and a guy where the hit tool isn't great and it never will be great, but the damage he does on contact is so intense that it's, you know, he's a guy who's hitting middle of the lineup um, I don't know if he's quite as fast of a runner as O'Neill, but I think Pereira is going to be a double digit stolen base guy, at least early on. So that's, that's my comp for Pereira. That's my ceiling comp for Pereira. <laughs> if I was confident that he was just Tyler O'Neill 2.0, he'd be even higher than he is. All right. Uh, Corey B. Uh, what are your thoughts on Spencer Jones and Zach Bean? Uh, both are overrated, albeit top 100 prospects. Uh, Jones's data is fantastic, uh, but everyone had all off season to sort of digest how fantastic his data was. He's you know he's a tall Yankee outfielder with power, blah blah blah. Like he hasn't faced, he hasn't been at an age appropriate level yet where we can kind of fairly judge where the hit tools at. I could see him struggling at Double A with strikeouts, for instance. Uh, but it, he's a top 100 prospect because of the power potential and he's a, he's a decent athlete. Um, but I, you know, I don't think he should be, I don't think he should be going like fifth in a first year player draft or anything crazy like that. Uh, now Zach Veen, 
a really tough guy for me to rank. Uh, sometimes I think I'm too low on Veen, but I'm also trying really hard to not have my evaluation of him swayed by others being much higher on him than I am. And so it's, I'm trying to kind of keep my sort of evaluation of him um, until he actually gives me something tangible where I sort of have to change it. Uh, I, I think people have said that I feel like a broken record with this, but I think people just drastically overrate his chances of being a 20 plus steel guy. And uh, I mean, it, like very similar Zach Veen and Anthony Volpe, just from a stolen base standpoint, I think people are just really uh, misconstruing how many stolen bases they can expect from both those guys in the big leagues. Um, it's just, it's so easy to steal bases in the minor leagues. And I know it's going to be easier in the big leagues, but I just, I don't buy this idea that teams are just going to be running well, every team's going to be running wild. And then even if they are, that's a rising tide. It's going to lift all boats. A bunch of guys that you didn't think were high stolen base guys are going to be stolen base guys at that point. So, um, and then I'm not sold on Veen's hit tool. Uh, and he start hasn't gotten to, uh, he hasn't gotten to all of his raw power in games consistently yet either. So, you know, uh, does a nice run <clears throat> in the Arizona Fall League change that? I mean, it, it, it puts some doubt into my mind about my evaluation, but I just, I'm going to stick with this one on Bean. Uh, BC, wondering what Tyler Glasnow's injury does to his dynasty value specifically. Would you still rank him ahead of Pablo Lopez, Logan Gilbert, or Blake Snell? Well, Glasnow's got an oblique strain. Which is not great, obviously, if you especially if you wanted value from him earlier this season. But I don't, I don't think an oblique strain is something where we're we should be really pushing a pitcher down the dynasty rankings. I can see pushing down the redraft rankings, uh, and I could, I could see if you, in dynasty, if you wanted to take Blake Snell over Tyler Glass now, uh, I'd say just go for it. You know, that's that's close enough that I've got no problems with that. Even Logan Gilbert, maybe. Uh, I can't get there on Pablo Lopez. I'd, I'd, I would just ride out Glass now there, and I, I don't, I don't think I'm going to move Glass now much at all. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of on a different page there than than you with the reaction to that oblique injury for Glass now. Uh, Matthew King, who had the more impressive minor league career, Adley Rutschman or Miguel Vargas? It's a fun question. I love these uh, outside the box questions like this. Uh, so better career in the minor leagues, Adley Rushman or Miguel Vargas. I'm going to say Vargas. He had a longer minor league career, obviously, because he was an international signee. Rutschman was a college draftee. Uh, so Vargas had more time to kind of uh, build his resume in the minors, but he was a 313 hitter in the minors, uh, which – Obviously, it's easier to hit for average in the minors than the majors, but that's that's good. Um, Adley was a 281 hitter. They had an identical 390 OBP, which is kind of fun. And I think Vargas should get credit because he improved his defense more than Adley did in the minors. This is because Adley came into the minors as a great defender. But if we're just saying who had the more impressive minor league career, I think there's there's more checks in Vargas's column. Phil Kramer, what do you see as Nathaniel Lowe's upside for the next few years in OVP leagues? Uh, I j just hope he repeats last year. Uh, there's, I don't think you should be, if there is another level beyond last year, great. Uh, if I have Nathaniel Lowe in a dynasty league, I just want him to repeat what he did last year. I know he finished the season. Uh, I know his second half splits are just crazy. He was playing over his head in the second half. He, he was getting better while playing over his head. But if you just give me his full 2022 season, I'd take that as Nathaniel Lowe's upside going forward. Uh, Rick Bonino, uh, Wilmer Flores, the Tigers pitching prospect, is a bit of a prospect list darling these days, but it appears you're not as impressed. Can you elaborate? Uh, I mean, this is kind of news to me. I I'm sure you're right. I don't know where he's a darling. Uh, he's a good prospect. He's, I think he's just kind of a number four starter, number three upside, bad team, bad tracker, developing pitching. Uh, 
but a good home park, um, but no run support. And just not very exciting for fantasy, uh, much better real life prospect. So maybe those are the lists you're talking about. I can tell you, I would have, I would have given away Wilmer Flores in uh, a couple dynasty leagues this off season for just a, a pick and I couldn't get any bites. So um, he's not, he's not a uh, darling in, in my circles at least. And then uh, final question uh, from Bricks, buddy Bricks. Uh, this is a serious one. Uh, he's got an upcoming dynasty startup of, ba- of baseball movie characters only. And despite the obvious risk, he wants to know if Henry Rowan Gardner is the slam dunk one, one given his age, given his age to level. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I couldn't hit Rowan Gardner. So, I mean, I think we saw that big leaguers had a hard time with Rowan Gardner stuff as well. So I think he's a pretty good one, one pick in my book. Uh, this has been the Roadwire Fantasy Baseball Podcast brought to you by Underdog Fantasy and Fantrax. Uh, thanks for tuning in and thanks to everyone for the 